Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the DIM 400 musculoskeletal lectures on elbow dysplasia. I am Dr. LaRue, and I will be presenting these lectures. The term elbow dysplasia refers to an abnormal development of the elbow joint. It's an all encompassing term for communication with the lay public, so the term elbow dysplasia doesn't specify the underlying abnormality. Elbow dysplasia is a polygenic and multifactorial progressive condition in certain dog breeds. It consists of four major developmental abnormalities. Now is maybe a good time to just go back to your notes on osteochondrosis and OCD and make sure that you understand the pathophysiology of that. This is because all four of these developmental abnormalities are blanketed under the condition osteochondrosis, as you will see later on. The four major developmental abnormalities are OCD, or osteochondrosis desiccans, ununited anconial process, fragmented medial coronoid process, and elbow joint incongruency. The end result of any of these four causes is elbow arthrosis, which leads to pain and lameness. If you look at the example of a mediolateral view of an elbow, there is a lot of new periarticular bone consistent with osteophytic new bone around the, the joint, and this is consistent with quite severe arthrosis in this patient. So the pathogenesis is attributed to osteochondrosis, which has several components that influence it. There definitely is an important genetic component, and hence why one needs to screen dogs before breeding them, and it's complex and not very well understood. Environmental effects can influence, um, can also influence osteochondrosis, for example, overnutrition, excessive calcium supplementation, or a young overweight dog, and then microtrauma can also play a role with mechanical overload. So if the articular cartilage is involved, so a thickened avascular articular cartilage, then we have manifestation of OCD. And I will, in the following slides, demonstrate where exactly everything occurs, with the end result being elbow arthrosis. If the physis is affected by osteochondrosis, there might be growth disparity between the radius and the ulna. And this is small disparity. It's not something that is obvious on a radiograph. In cases where there's a short radius or a long ulna, as the ulna keeps growing, the medial coronoid process will push up against the humeral condyle and it can result in fissuring and fragmentation of the cartilage there. And this results in a fragmented medial coronoid process. This growth disparity can also result in elbow incongruency with the eventual end result being arthrosis. In other cases of a short ulna or long radius, as the radius keeps growing, it, keep, it pushes up against the humeral condyle, and this prevents the anconius from fusing. Again, this can result in incongruency, um, leading to elbow arthrosis, or ununited anconial process if the anconius does not fuse. In cases where the trochlear notch is incongruent, this incongruency um, will result in weight bearing on an abnormal joint with cartilage damage and eventually will also lead to elbow arthrosis. Frustratingly, sometimes there's no radiological cause that can be found, but it can be any of the above. And often what happens in older dogs when they already have severe arthrosis, the underlying cause is not seen on the, on the radiographs because of all the new bone formation due to the arthrosis. So elbow dysplasia normally occurs in intermediate and heavy set dogs, and it's most commonly seen in the following breeds. In the Labrador, they tend to get fragmented medial coronoid process and OCD, with those two often um, occurring together. The G is just prone to ununited anconial process. The Rottweiler is prone to fragmented medial coronoid process, and the Bulbul gets ununited anconial process and fragmented medial coronoid process. So these are typically breeds that are often um, brought for elbow dysplasia. Several radiographic views will help assess the elbow in cases of elbow dysplasia. And I think the most important ones from DIM 400 point of view that are practically applicable in 
private practice are the first four. And I will go through these individually. So the medial lateral and the craniocaudal views are the standard orthogonal views of the elbow, which you will be taking in any case. It's good for obvious lesions and to detect arthrosis, but often additional views are needed to determine the exact cause of the elbow dysplasia. The mediolateral flexed view is used for the elbow dysplasia grading scheme. The flexion allows visualization of more of the anconial process over here to look for pathology there and also to look for osteophyte formation in that area, which would indicate degenerative joint disease. The oblique view or the cranial 15 degrees lateral chordomedial oblique is good to visualize the medial coronoid process should be over here, as well as the medial humeral condyle over here. This is important because most of the pathology can occur here, for example, OCD, which would affect the medial coronoid, um, sorry, the medial condyle of the humerus, and the medial coronoid process, which is affected by fragmented medial coronoid process. The view up at the top, the caudal 75 degrees medial craniolateral oblique is also called the extended supinated mediolateral. What's nice about this view is it shows the cranial margin of the medial coronoid process running up here. And then lastly, the craniomedial caudolateral oblique is opposite to the previous view that we've discussed. And this will show the lateral epicondyle better. This view is not so important for elbow dysplasia, but maybe for other conditions in cases where the condyles of the humerus have not fused and then there's a radiolucent line between them. So don't worry too much about this view. Right, so the first condition we'll be looking at is ununited anconial process. This typically occurs in larger breed dogs because they have a separate center of ossification for the anconius. The anconia should fuse to the rest of the ulna by 20 weeks or five months of age, but what happens in cases where there's relative overgrowth of the radius, as the radius keeps growing relative to the ulna, it places pressure on the condyles of the humerus and that will then put pressure on this anconius process and prevent it from fusing. Here's an example um, of some radiographs following the elbow of a German Shepherd puppy from 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and 20 weeks of age to demonstrate how the anconius process fuses. So in the first radiograph at 10 weeks, there's hardly anything visible in this area. There's maybe a faint little mineralized structure present. With time, there's increased mineralization in this area. By 16 weeks here, it's almost completely fused. There is a little bit of a lucent area there still, but by 20 weeks, the anconius is completely fused and well formed, and it has its normal sort of curved beak shaped appearance. In ununited anconial process, in the schematic image, there is a jagged radiolucent vertical line that forms or that, that demonstrates the separation from the anconius process, which is not fused to the rest of the ulna. And there may be some new bone formation indicative of arthrosis formation. So this is a nice example just demonstrating the schematic image. On radiographs, the finding can often be bilaterally symmetrical. So for any of the elbow dysplasias, it's important to take both left and right limbs, not just the affected limb. The flexed mediolateral, as I've mentioned, really removes superimposition from the rest of the distal humerus from the anconia, so one can visualize it very well. And in this case, there's a lucent jagged vertical line here between the anconius process and the rest of the ulna in dogs that are more than 20 weeks of age. The arthrosis that develops can be quite severe in this specific um, cause of elbow dysplasia. And again, incongruency may be seen, which we'll get to a little bit later. Here is another example of ununited anconial process. 
The image on the left is more flexed than the image on the right, so it just demonstrates what the difference in the views are, how easily it is to see this vertical fissure versus on the normal neutral mediolateral, the superimposition of the medial epicondylar crest over that area, and it might confuse things a little bit. Another thing that might be confusing is in young puppies of less than six months old, the medial humeral epicondyle has got its own physis, and that radiolucent line, if it's superimposed over the anconius, may look like an ununited anconial process. The way that we can determine whether it is true or not is just by taking a flexed view. The flexion then removes that physis from superimposing over the anconius, and here we can see the anconius is fused and it is normal. Next, we will look at the medial coronoid process, which is part of the ulna. It's found by following the cranial cortex of the ulna, and if we follow it up, it forms a nice, sharp, pointed um, structure. On the inverted image, it's also very nice to see. This is one of the benefits of digital radiography, but one can see that very nice, pointed, triangular medial coronoid process, which is normal in this patient. What happens with medial, um, with fragmented medial coronoid process is that it's um, the same pathogenesis as OCD or osteochondrosis. There's asynchronous radius and ulnar growth with relative ulnar overgrowth, which is microscopic. As the ulna keeps growing, this medial coronoid process will push against the humeral condyle. And because of this abnormal um, load on it, it can fissure and fragment. Elbow incongruency can also be seen at the same time. So in this schematic image over here, this is what a normal medial coronoid process is meant to look like. It's meant to be a nice, sharply pointed structure, versus often on radiographs, all we see is that it's blunted. Often we don't see the fragment because the fragment might still be made of cartilage, so it's radiolucent, or it may be very small, or it just depends on how the beam ang is angulated relative to the fragment. What may additionally sometimes be seen with fragmented medial coronoid process is what we call a kissing lesion. A kissing lesion occurs on the medial humeral condyle in the subchondral bone, and this is a result of abrasion of the cartilage here due to the displaced fragmented medial coronoid process, or possibly due to osteophytes forming on the medial coronoid process. It tends to be located more laterally on the condyle, and it will take a little bit of time to develop. On radiographs of fragmented medial coronoid process, it's important again to, to um, obtain views of both elbows in case it is bilaterally symmetrical. The radiographic changes might lag behind the clinical sign, so the dog might be lame before we see anything on radiographs. They may have concurrent OCD, which is the next um, section we'll be looking at. They might have arthrosis again. The medial coronoid process might be indistinct or blunted, as I've mentioned, and rarely the fragment is seen. Again, congruency might also be seen. For example, here, the arrow indicates a little round fragment sitting medially. And it's important to remember that if there is a mineralized opacity sitting laterally, it's more likely to be, um, or it's likely to be the sesamoid in the supinator muscle. And don't get that confused with a fragmented medial coronoid process. Here are some more examples. This is the craniolateral cordomedial oblique view, which highlights the medial humeral condyle as well as the medial coronoid process and there's a small little fragment present um, consistent with fragmented medial coronoid process. We're lucky on this craniocaudal view, medially one again sees an oval mineralized structure which is consistent with the fragment scene. The fragments can be very small but sometimes we're lucky and they're very large. On the right-sided um, right image with the mediolateral view, if you follow the medial coronoid process up, 
It's meant to be a nice sharp structure. Here suddenly it's blunted. And then there's a large triangular mineralized opacity separated from it. And that's consistent with the fragment. On the craniocaudal view, it's a little bit more difficult to see, but there is this oval mineralized fragment sitting medially, consistent with the fragmented medial coronoid process. So the third one we'll be looking at is osteochondrosis, again, often bilaterally symmetrical. And again, the craniolateral cordomedial oblique is the best to view to define it because it highlights the medial condyle of the humerus. So what we see is a saucer-shaped flattening or defect in the subchondral bone of the humerus, affecting the medial condyle. Sometimes there's a bit of sclerosis adjacent to it, and arthrosis again can be present, and rarely a cartilage flap can be seen. In this case, there's only a defect seen. Again, the schematic image here just demonstrates where one would expect to find the subchondral defect with a halo of sclerosis around it. And on the actual radiograph on the right, the arrows depict quite a large radiolucent subchondral bone defect. This patient also has some irregular new bone on the medial epicondyle, as well as in the region of the um, medial coronoid process, as well as the, the humeral articular margin here. So this patient already has got some arthrosis. Again, just another example, this is the oblique view that I keep harping on how nicely one can see the defect in the medial condyle. And then the image on the right, one's lucky enough to see a little fragment sitting in there, which is a piece of thickened cartilage that would have fissured off and has mineralized. It's important to also note that OCD and fragmented medial coronoid process often go together, so one needs to look out for the two of them in the same patient. Here's an example of that. Unfortunately, it's a digitized radiograph, so the quality is not that great, but on the medial humeral condyle, there is a saucer-shaped defect, and then there's a poorly mineralized opacity sitting over the region of the medial coronoid process. So this is a, um, a case of OCD and fragmented medial coronoid process occurring together. Lastly, we go on to elbow incongruency. This can be due to increased humero ulnar or humero radial joint space. And often gap or step formation is seen between the lateral coronoid process and the adjacent proximal radius. So in this radiograph demonstrates it nicely. The trochlear notch of the ulna here is widened. There is definitely an increase in joint space between the humerus and the radial head. And then the lateral coronoid process is in this region over here, and there's a step formation between it and the radial head. CT is very nice to demonstrate these cases because it removes superimposition and allows you to um, format the, the image in any plane that you'd like. Here, there's obvious step formation between the ulna and the, the radial head, as well as widening of the trochlear notch. So both these cases really nicely demonstrate an incongruent elbow joint. So the end result of elbow dysplasia is variable degrees of osteoarthrosis, and there are specific sites that we assess for new bone. The lateral epicondylar crest is one of them. Remember the medial epicondylar crest is the boxy shaped one, where the lateral one is the curved smooth one that follows down onto the um, condyles. In this example over here, there's a lot of new bone formation present on the lateral epicondylar crest. We also look for osteophytes at the medial coronoid process and at the medial epicondyle. For example, um, this is a slightly oblique craniocaudal view. There's a lot of new bone formation here medially. You can see it's that pointed osteophyte. And there's irregularity here of the medial epicondyle consistent with arthrosis. 
So this slide is very important so that you know where to look for new bone to determine whether the patient has arthrosis or not. So some areas include the dorsal border of the anconial process, the cranial proximal aspect of the radius, proximal edge of the medial coronoid process, the proximal edge of the lateral epicondylar crest or ridge. There can be sclerosis in the area caudal to the distal end of the trochlear notch and the proximal radius. I just call this the subtrochlear or infratrochlear area. And then also the distal aspect of the medial humeral condyle and the medial aspect of the medial coronoid process. So we use a combination of the orthogonal views to decide and to determine if there is new bone formation. So I've just included some CT images that demonstrate how much better CT is at looking at um, elbows compared to radiographs. On the sagittal image over here, there's incongruency. So there's a widened humero ulnar and humeral radial joint space. And there is a bit of subtrochlear sclerosis present. On the transverse image in B, this is at the level of the humeral condyles. There's sclerosis here of the humeral condyle. If you compare it to the lateral one, the medial one is much more white. And in these cases, we need to look for pathology, either an OCD lesion or possibly a kissing lesion. On the dorsal plane, there's clear step formation between the radius on this side and the ulna. So there's elbow incongruency. And this last image is taken through the level of the medial coronoid process. So the radius is this bone over here, and the ulna is the one over here. There is the fragmented medial coronoid process. The rest of the coronoid process is very sclerotic, and this radial notch is very irregular. So it just demonstrates how CT removes any superimposition and is much more sensitive. So because of the hereditary component of elbow dysplasia, screening and grading prior to breeding is very important. Selective breeding has proven to reduce the incidence within susceptible breeds, and the Interna International Elbow Working Group aims to increase knowledge and awareness of elbow dysplasia and help spread information about it, and as well as looking at screening plans. So as an example, breeding two parents with normal elbows will only result in 12% of the offspring being affected. If one parent has dysplastic elbows, between 26 and up to 31% of offspring might be affected. And breeding parents who both have dysplastic elbows, we can see that there's a large increase. So up to 41.5% of offspring might be affected by elbow dysplasia. So for elbow dysplasia grading, radiographs are taken at 12 months of age, together usually with the hip dysplasia radiographs. Giant breeds and Rottweilers are taken a bit later, so at 18 months. And a single good quality flexed mediolateral radiograph is required. It needs to be properly identified. So the patient microchip number or tattoo number needs to be embedded in the image. And the films are evaluated by a specialist veterinary radiologist. The images are graded from zero to three. And it does not have to identify the primary cause. Often the grading is based on the degree of arthrosis present. So unfortunately, screening, screening with radiographs is far from ideal because subtle lesions can be missed. But at the moment, it is what is done. Grade zero implies that there is no radiological changes, and this is a normal elbow. Grade one, there are osteophytes present of up to two millimeters high. Grade two, the osteophytes are between two to five millimeters high. And grade three, the osteophytes are greater than five millimeters. So in this single radiograph here, there are osteophytes present on the anconial process. That's all that new bone sitting there with the normal anconius underlying here. So this will be a grade two. These osteophytes are probably between two and five millimeters high. On these images over here, if you compare the normal to the grade two image, again, there's osteophytes present on top of the anconius, which are not present in the normal elbow. And this will be a grade two if it's between two and five millimeters high. Now, in these cases, 
the cause for the alba, alba dysplasia is not clear. I don't see a fragmented medial coronoid process. I don't see an ununited anconial process. And the congruency seems adequate, but it doesn't matter. In these cases, the grading is based on the, the degree of arthrosis, as arthrosis is abnormal in the elbow. Here's just an, another example that's more severe. This would have been osteophytes of um, greater than five millimeters in height present on the anconial process. There's subtrochlear or infratrochlear sclerosis, if you compare it to the normal um, joints over here. And there's definitely osteophytes present here on the cranioproximal radial head. So even again, in this case, I don't see an underlying cause, but I can make the grading based on the presence and the degree of arthrosis. So lastly, looking at this image, there very clearly is an ununited anconial process. So the minute that one can see a cause for the elbow dysplasia, the patient gets a grade three. This patient also has severe um, arthrosis, so marked um, osteophytic new bone affecting the lateral epicondylar crest. There's new bone here along the radial head. There's um, infratrochlear or subtrochlear sclerosis here. And if we had to look for the um, medial coronoid process and follow it up here, it's quite blunt. There's that nice sharp triangular structure is absent. Um, so this dog automatically would get a grade three. All right, so that is the end of the elbow dysplasia lectures. Um, next, we will be going on to the pelvic limb.